Good to see you guys today. Hope you have your Bibles with you today and you'll find with me 2 Timothy chapter 4. As we wrap up this series on leadership, uh, we're going to spend our time there this morning. But if you by chance were to happen along, whether you do or not, find it also, James chapter 5, I will actually begin there this morning. James chapter 5 and 2 Timothy chapter 4. We wrap up this series this morning as we've been talking about uh, the letters, the, the, the pastoral letters from the Apostle Paul to young Timothy, and ultimately Titus was also a part of that group of letters. We've talked mostly about Timothy, and we've been talking about it from the perspective of the leadership development issues that Paul talks to Timothy about as he's seeking to help him to rise up to become the leader of the church at Ephesus that needs uh, some help. Paul had invited Timothy and asked Timothy to come alongside this struggling church, and Timothy stepped into a church, and, 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 and as Paul reminded him that his goal while there was to do one thing, and that was to train himself to be godly. There needed to be something on the inside, the character development on the inside of the, of the young Timothy to be able to stand forth and to stand tall in the midst of difficult times, as, as well as just being a good example to the people around him. Timothy looked back in his life, and while he was in this struggling church, he also told him that as you go there, I want to challenge you, sort of reflecting back over the past weeks that we've been before, to challenge you that, that as you address and as you speak, that you speak to them with, out of love, that issues from a heart that's found purity, from a conscience that is clean, and from a faith that is indeed sincere. Realizing Paul would say that even to young Timothy, there's going to be some pushback and uh, he needed to realize that the goal of the church and in the midst of it is God's church was to be a place where they would understand how to conduct themselves in the household of God. And as a result of that, they would find themselves understanding that the church itself, you and I, even some 2000 years later, today in our culture still stands as the pillar and foundation of truth. Since so much of leadership development today deals with the, the how-tos or to somehow the, the, how to close the deal the best, Paul continued to drill down in the young Timothy the fact that real leadership development deals with the inner man in the area of character and there of virtue, the elements that are not obvious to everyone until a crisis occurs, till difficulties happen, until you mash your finger with a hammer, Right? The inner character then is displayed in these moments. Jesus taught his disciples this in Matthew chapter 12. For out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil things. Character is then set on display in our lives for all to see when difficulties come to our families and to our dif- to our, to our, to our children and the like, the real value of one's commitment to scripture is seen in these moments of life. As last week we addressed our graduates, Paul even told young Timothy to, to remind him that he is to set himself in his example, not to the worst guy in the church, but the, to the best guy in church. To set himself an example to those he leads, and he will do that only by guarding what he, how he acts and what he says which anyone can do, but those external qualities are seen. But he said even beyond that, he must drill down on the inner man to be able to deal with the issues of within himself that nobody else may see, that of love and of purity of mind and ultimately of steadfast faith. You know, there's been some transformative moments in every one of our lives, and obviously there have been in mine as well. And this morning, I'd like to sort of begin with looking back and reflecting back upon some of those transformative moments. I I used to use these terms around here. These are character-building opportunities. I don't like that term anymore because I don't really like that character development. But anyway, the reality is there have been those moments in every one of our lives. But let me, if I can, just invite you into a few of the ones I, that have been for me. It was back in 1995, in, the, in October of 1995, as we pulled in with a big old U-Haul down to Wilmington, North Carolina. We arrived at about 2 o'clock in the morning. And at 5 a.m. that morning, the next morning, 
the same morning, the one and the same, Dr. Bill Bennett called me and he had this sort of a rough, gruff voice. Uh, Pastor Dave, just want to call you this morning. Tell you I've been praying for you. And I, at that point, moment of my life, I didn't know that there was a five o'clock in the morning. But needless to say, somehow another age has a way of catching up with us and we learn about those things in life. But anyway, he, he, he mentioned to me that morning, ultimately Dr. Bennett was for the next seven years was not only going to be one who encouraged me to begin with, but ultimately became one of those people that helped to disciple me in, 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 in these early days of, of becoming a pastor. In his call, he stated that he was calling and he was, had been praying for me that morning and he, he, he felt the nudge of the Lord to read James chapter 5, verse 11, and I draw your attention there this morning. You know, there, there's one of those passages that I've really wished he would have been praying something like this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That would have been a great encouragement. But he said, Pastor Dave, just thought I'd call you and let you know, been praying for you today and believe God wants me to tell you to read James 5, 11. That needs to be the pattern of ministry for you, okay? I knew James fairly well. It had been one of those books that I had studied intensely in, in the original language. Had a fair understanding of what he was going to say before he ever got there, but here's the verse that in the passage this morning. It says, Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. I'm going to be reading today out of the King James Version, especially when we get to 2 Timothy. This is the Bible that was given to me on my ordination. But the King James says, Behold, we count them happy who endure. The word endure or the word remain steadfast is a word that comes from the original language that's the word hupameno. Really doesn't mean a lot to most of us, but the word actually means to remain under, to not flee to persevere under misfortunes and trials, to hold fast to one's faith in Christ, to endure or to bear bravely and calmly with, with ill treatments, to remain under the pressure without crumbling to it. And I, and I would have been okay if the verse just ended there. You know, that, that's, that, 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 that helps us, you know, just to say, okay, we can sort of figure out what they may look like in every one of our lives, but then James had to give us an illustration of what that looks like. And if you look at your Bibles, you see that illustration. And Pastor um, uh, Dr. Bill Bennett went on to tell me that. Remember Job? <laughs> yeah. It's not the guy I want to model life after. What about you? Yeah, I remember Job. You've heard of Job and the pa his patience and have seen the end of the Lord and that the Lord is pitiful and of tender mercy. He gave us an illustration that Job, through all the trials of life, though many people around him encouraged him to just curse God and die. He said, I, it's too much for me to do that. That's not my calling. Rather, I came into this world naked and I'll, I'll leave this world naked. All I know to do is just say, blessed be the name of the Lord. I must confess, going into a church of gray hair, and that's what the that church was at 33 years of age, what I didn't realize for the next, what I didn't realize even before, before I got there, that, I, that the average pastoral stay in that church was 13 months. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot, maybe, especially in light of the only long-term pastor that was there. He was there 13 years, and if you put all the rest of them together and still come up to an average of 13 months... <laughs> Somehow way or another, there wasn't a long pastoral stay. Matter of fact, in, that, in our culture, we would oftentimes say that that was probably a widow-maker church. It was a church that killed pastors. Not literally, they didn't bring out and shoot somebody, but it was a difficult church. For the first five years I was there, I found myself drudging through the difficulties. I didn't realize that he was speaking prophetically really over me and even if we, if, but uh, he, was, he, 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 he was able to see beyond what I could see. And in reality, the first five years, I had so many resumes out trying to find somewhere else to go. It was pitiful. <laughs> and there was no opportunities available. I was trying to get out of Dodge. You've been there maybe in your life. You've, you've been in a situation you didn't want to be in, and you were trying everything in the world you could to get out of it. I was. 
And had I got out of it in years one, two, three, four, five, I would have missed years six and seven. But the reality is blessing comes after steadfastness. Scripture says that, teaches that time and time and time again. The steadfast challenge that we've been challenged to, and we struggle with it because we're all emotional beings and we too often allow our emotions to guide our actions rather than allowing my weakness to be strengthened by his strength. And that brings us to a second transformative event in my life. It was yesterday, 29 years ago, that our son died. And I remember in Duke University Hospital, and I've told you this story many times, reaching down and literally doing what I tell you never to do, just opening the Bible up. And when the Bible opened up, it opened up to 2 Corinthians 12. And I read that day, that passage that became truly one of those transformative moments when I read about the Apostle Paul having this infirmity. What was it? We don't really know. Scholars have said maybe it's blindness. We don't really know. But what we do know, it was troubling to him. And three different times he prayed that God would remove it from him. You've been there. I've I've been there. Have you not? Lord, this is a mess. Get me out of this mess. You know, we've maybe have prayer, prayed a prayer something like this. Lord, if you'll get me out of this mess, I'll serve you the rest of my life. Has anybody ever done that? Okay. I think, Jay, I think Paul, was about, Paul was in one of those moments of his life where he was just over it. Three different times he cried out before God and said, God, can you take this from me? And three times God said to him these words, and I'll, these have been transformative words in my life. My grace is what? Sufficient for you in your time of need. For in your weakness, my power has has been perfected or been made perfect in your weakness. In other words, we never understand and we'll never understand the ability for God to work in us until we've come to the end or we've emptied ourselves of us. Human nature has to do, I grew up in North Carolina. I remember in those early days, you know, my dad used to say, son, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you know? I mean, you just, you're a man. You've got to do those kind of things. I remember Dr. Huntley coming in when my, when my dad was dying in 1981, in January of 1981. And he looked, came in that night before my dad died and he looked at me and he, as an 18-year-old son and he said, David, you're now man of this family. You need to be the man. And I thought, I can do that. And I remember how that felt and the responsibility that it was and found myself not willing and able to grieve with my own dad's death because I was trying to be the man. What I didn't realize and what I've continued to learn through this journey of life is that God brings those challenges in our life oftentimes to remind us that we are not sufficient to deal with life challenges. Life is bigger than we are, and we need a sovereign God who is able to help us to navigate those challenges so that we navigate them well. So he brings us oftentimes to the place where we come to the end of ourself, where where we realize our own weakness, because it's only when we come to the end of ourself that we'll ever find his strength to be sufficient. Because otherwise, we continue to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We continue to do life ourselves. We'll fix it because that's what we've been called to do. And there's a lot of things in life that are just not fixable by our human effort. The last piece I would like to say regarding my transformative points, there's been many of them, was in April of 1990, as I found myself in a little bitty country church up in Lynch Station, Virginia. L-Y-N-C-H, Lynch Station, Virginia. How many has ever heard of Lynch Station, Virginia? You realize, my goodness, we had one person in the first service say the same. I'd never heard of it before then. I've heard of Alta Vista, maybe. I've heard of Lynchburg, but I've never heard of Lynch Station. Little church, 23 people there. And I had an opportunity to be able to come that day. And my pastor from North Carolina, which Dan Merritt's always been considered my pastor. Dan Merritt came up and actually preached that evening for my charge and then there was a young lady a lady not so young but her name was Dorothy Petty or Dot Petty we called her that was the wife of the pastor that I served underneath for for the first staff position 
he died shortly after we got there with, with bone cancer, and his wife came to actually present the Bible to me and to give a personal challenge. It was that day that she read from 2 Timothy 4, and I'd like to read today that passage that she read to me and then a comment she made at the end that I did not understand then, but boy, I'm learning to understand today. Would you listen carefully? I'm reading out of the King James Version, so if your Bibles read a little bit differently than that this morning, I know I don't typically do that, but if you allow me to go, sort of go back to my roots, I'd like to do that today in this passage. First, Second Timothy 4 verse 1 says, I charge you thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be diligent in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers having themselves itch, itching ears. And they shall turn, away from their, t- turn their ears away from the truth and shall be turned into fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. And this is the passage that we probably all know very well. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. What does Paul say? I have fought a good, what? Fight. I have finished my race or course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all, but unto all them that love his appearing. And I'll never forget when she finished reading that day, she looked eye to eye to me. You know, when you look eye to eye to somebody, you, you there's something serious getting ready to say, and she looked eye to eye to me and she said these words. David, you'll never get to verses 6, 7, and 8 until you go through verses 1 through 5. I I thought, well, sure, that sounds good to me. I didn't understand it, but as we have allowed the seasons of life to somewhat continue to shape us, what I do understand is, you know, we oftentimes come to a time in our life where we, we sort of bring to a a celebrate, celebratory end of somebody's life. And we hear those last three verses used a lot of times in funeral messages. This past week, on Wednesday night, we had the opportunity to, to share a, a time of celebration with Miss Millie Kimbrell. What a sweet, precious lady that she was. I, I shared that passage with, or I shared her life's verse with the church because Ashley, her, her granddaughter, had said this is her life's verse. And I've never known anybody who had this life's verse, and I thought this would be a great one. Uh, Great. So I I, I shared it with the church, and Philippians chapter 4, verse, not 13, but verse 11 was her life's verse. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Contentment's a learned trait. It's like everything else in life. It's the, it's the development of our lives to bring us to the place where we can find within our current situation, no matter what it is, that we find a state of being content. And Miss Millie de- demonstrated that as well as anybody I've ever met in my life. So I bring this passage to us today, and I've sort of set the stage for what we're going to say this morning with this small paragraph at the top of your notes this morning, if you'll follow along with me this today. It simply says this, Paul's admonition to young Timothy in the latter verses is one that we often focus on to celebrate the end of life and a believer's faithfulness and reward. Yet in this context, the passage begins with a challenge to lead faithfully for life. And the ending verses are set as a navigational tool for the journey of life. We want to get to the end. We want to hear the well done, good, and faithful servant. But I wonder, do we really understand the price that's paid in order to hear those words? Are we willing to demonstrate the faithfulness, well done, good, and faithful servant? Are we willing to demonstrate the faithfulness for life that we might be able to hear 
those words. And I believe this context of this passage gives to us a little bit of insight to that. And so for the next few minutes, I'd like to give a brief outline to this passage, and I'll move fairly quickly this morning, for, t- for time this morning is, is already running by. This passage tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, first of all, there is that he has been commissioned before God. I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ. I've given you three little bullet points underneath that that I'm not looking for you to fill in the blanks, but I, I want you to I want there to be points of ponder because what does it mean for us? How do we, how do we understand the fact that, that, that as Paul talks about himself and ultimately, and ultimately communicates that charge to young Timothy, and I believe that charge to every one of us today, how does that apply to our life? I, I believe it could be, could, could be understood in these particular ways. One, God calls and gifts every one of us. In other words, we've all been invited into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we've all been gifted, the spiritual gifts, the gifts of God, to be able to, the gifts of the Spirit, to be able to minister or to serve within his church. He's gifted and called every one of us. And so in that regard, the commission before God is one that God has already preempted. He's already done the work. He's already planned out for us. He's already gifted us for it. He's equipped us for what God has called us to do. But not only do we see it from that perspective, we also see it that God becomes a witness then to the charge or to the challenge. As God stands as the judge above all the universe, he also becomes a witness to his commissioning in our lives. He's done that through the word of God. Our our great responsibility, the great commission is going to all the world and preach the gospel to all nations, right? So therefore, we've got a responsibility. It's his commission to every one of us, not to, to a select few But he stands as a witness to that, as to testify of the investment that he's made into every one of our lives personally. And if he's called us and equipped us and stands as a witness to us for his invitation for service, does it not make sense also that he also becomes the just judge at the end of life that one day we'll all have to stand before? You know, we oftentimes in church don't like to talk about that anymore. It's, we want to talk about heaven and all the glories of heaven, and it is a beautiful place. I've never been there, but I'm looking forward to getting there. I'm not necessarily looking for a bus, bus ride today, but I'm looking forward to it more and more every day. But what I do know is this, is that every one of us will stand before God in judgment one day. We'll, we'll escape the Revelation 20 judgment. That's the scary one. You know, when the books are open and the book is open and we find ourselves, all those who are not written in the Lamb's book of life were cast in the lake of fire. The neat thing about it is if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you'll never have to deal with that judgment. That judgment's taken care of. Jesus did that for you. But if you go to Scripture, you'll understand in 1 Corinthians 3 that every one of us are going to stand before God and the life that we lived the faith that God gave to us, the investment he made into our life, the gifts that he gave us to serve him will all be tested by fire. And there'll be some opportunities in life for some of those things to be tested in such a way that the wood, hay, and stubble of our life, the junk of our life will be burned up, consumed. There'll be some jewels left behind, the gold, silver, the precious stones that will actually be left behind that will ultimately be as an opportunity for us to be able to say thank you to what God has done for us as they will be a testimony of the faithfulness that you and I chose to serve through our life. We have an opportunity one day, we've been commissioned in one of these days, we'll have an opportunity to stand before God to be able to give an account for the life that God entrusted to us. Secondly, He's given to every one of us a charge to lead, a charge to lead. Proclaim the word, he tells us in verse 2. Actually, if you look at this passage, there are five imperatives. I've given that into your notes this morning. The word imperative simply means command. 
five imperatives for those of us who are going to accept the call for us to be able to lead and to, to lead out in life, to be, to be the people that God has called us to be. He's given to us five imperatives. And these five imperatives I've given also as a list to you, not necessarily to fill in the blanks, but as a list to you, we're called to proclaim the word. In other words, we need to be a man or woman of the word. We need to learn the themes and the outlines of the books. We need to memorize great passages of scripture. If the Bible was taken from us, how much of the Bible would we remember? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, right? Maybe. Would you know others? Philippians 1, 6, being confident in this very thing, that God who hath begun a good work in you will continue till, till till the day of Jesus Christ. How much of it more would you know? We need to memorize. We need to, we need to immerse ourselves in the, in the stories of the Bible, to know the people of the Bible, to walk with them. They become, Hebrews chapter 12, great witnesses, a great cloud of witnesses. That's why Hebrews 11 was written to us, so that we can have some men and women who were not perfect, who miserably messed up a lot of their life, but somehow or another, because of faith, God was able to use them mightily to do his work. Be a student of the word. Proclaim his word. Also stand ready always. What does that mean? When it's easy and when it's not. When it's difficult, when it's, when it, when it's not so difficult. When it's convenient, when it's not convenient. The word of God is a tool that God has entrusted us to use, not as a weapon, but a, as, to use to be able to shape and mold our lives and to help others to shape and mold their lives as well. And we use it three ways, he mentions, to reprove. In other words, showing people where they're wrong. Helping people to see the wrong, what, wrong of their way. Use the word to help them to see the error of their way. To rebuke, literally to tell them to stop. Sometimes you just need to say stop. We need to be the Barney Fife's of the world. You know, with the one bullet, just nip it in the bud. Some of you never seen those reruns. That's okay. I, that's an old, old man joke. And lastly, we need to encourage. The word of God's filled with encouragement. And we need the encouragement of the word of God in our life to continue on in this journey. And we do all those imperatives with these two statements. With all patience. With all patience. That's not the hupomeno patience. That's patience that's defined as you and I said in traffic on twenty seven. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for slowing me down today. With all patience and with careful instruction, in other words, being true to the word of God. God has spoken clearly to us in his word. And there is clarity on how we deal with most of the things in life that we'll ever have to deal with. The problem is, for us to use the Word of God in its proper form, we have to submit ourselves to the authority of God's Word. And the truth of the matter is, that's where most of us struggle. Would we agree? So the third thing that's mentioned here. <laughs> Verse, verse 3 tells us, and, and I'm basically just giving you the outline that she gave me years ago in my, in my Bible as she sort of marked up and gave me some insight. The third one is simply this, never give up. Why? Because there's a time coming when people will, will not endure sound teaching, and it's going to be so easy for us just to sort of say, I'm throwing in the towel. I told a story earlier, and my, Karen and I were in a standing in line. I don't me- really remember where it was, but we were standing in line this past week, and we'd been there a little while, and I, 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 I'm sitting here, you know, we're just sort of sitting there twiddling our thumbs and doing the things that we do so well while we're standing in line. And in front of us, there was a young lady that was there, and she just went, <laughs> walked off. And I said to Karen, she threw in the white towel, because that's what she did. She had waited long enough. I don't know what her day was like. I'm not here to judge what she did, but what she did really really was simply she gave up. Wherever she was heading and whatever she was getting ready to do, there was something more important she had to go to. I I don't know. But in that same vein, we as followers of Christ have it so easy for us sometimes just to throw in the white towel. Galatians 6, 9 says this, let us not grow weary in doing good 
For in due season we will reap if we do not quit or give up. So easy for us to give up. Number four in your notes, expect opposition. There's going to come a time when people will turn away from listening to the truth and they'll wander off into their own myths. So easy for us to sort of get to that place when we're ready to to sort of go in life and we want things to be easy. I want things to be. Every one of us do. I, I love it when all the pieces fit together easily. Don't you? But when something doesn't work or something pushes back or we find ourselves, you know, and whatever it may be in our life, but we realize not only in, in most of our circumstances of life, there's oftentimes opposition to, does your children ever oppose your parenting style? Sometimes they do. There's opposition. John 16, 33 says it this way. I have said these things to you. That in me, in Christ, you'll have peace. But in this world, you'll not have peace. You'll have tribulation. But be encouraged. Take heart. Jesus says, I have overcome the world. Expect opposition. Number five, she wrote down, just do your duty. I guess first service, I did not sit quite with the long you I needed to, and maybe it sounded a little bit different like something else, but we're going to try the duty. Is that better? Thank you. I love my wife. She helps me to get to say words I need to say and not words I shouldn't say. And so, uh, but I, we, at the end of the day, we need to do what God has called us to do. We need to find ourselves in a time in life, watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. It's tough. Do the, do the work of the evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. What has God called you to do? What's the last thing he told you? Keep doing it until he tells you to do something different. Just do your duty. Do the work, hard work of a soldier. Stand at guard. Do what he's called you to do. Why? Because that's what God has called us to do. As a matter of fact, writer of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, as he writes, and if you've read the book of Ecclesiastes, it's a, it's a hard book to stomach because you hear Solomon say, I've tried this and <sighs> didn't work. I tried this, didn't work. I tried this, didn't work. Tried this, didn't work. And he comes sort of sum up life this way. What I figured out in life is life is simply filled with emptiness. Vanity, vanity, vanity all is vanity. <laughs> Everything worthless. But then he comes to the end and he said, I found one thing. In the continual struggle of life to try to find meaning, I found that the greatest thing I can ever do in life is simply the whole duty of man is to love God or fear God and keep his commandments. And we've got to get through verses 1 through 5 in order to get to verse 6, 7, and 8. Paul's writing to young Timothy. He's a young guy. He's probably in his 20s, most scholars would say. The Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy, this would be his last letter he would ever write. He's writing at the end goal of his life. Speaking to young Timothy with clear challenges of, of, of what is before him. Stay the course. Keep doing it. Preach the word. Do what God's called you to do. Lead out in life as God has called you to lead out in life. Be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. But I stand as one who has done that. And I want to tell you today, verse 6, I'm ready to go home. That's what he said in verse 6. Why am I ready to go home? Because I fought a good fight. I finished the race God gave me. You've yet to run that race. You're running it now. And I've kept the faith through the journey. What I'm looking forward to, the Apostle Paul says, there's a crown of righteousness that God has prepared for me. <laughs> but not just for me, but for every one of us who have loved his appearing. So from the end goal of life, the Apostle Paul challenges young Timothy, stay the course, 
Stay the course, keep doing it. And when you get to the end of your life, you can say that like I say, I'm ready to leave this whole world. I've done what I've been called to do. And I'm looking forward to that which is to come. Amen? Let me give you two or three statements of application, if I can, for all of us, because I think this passage, while it's oftentimes used to speak to preachers, and it is, it's a challenge, and it, as it was in my life many years ago for, for, a cha- for a commissioning service for my ordination back in 1990, and it was, that, it was the beginning of that point for me, but this passage is, however, applicable to every one of us because every one of us have been called to salvation. Do you know Christ is your personal Savior? Have you accepted Christ's invitation to trust him as your Savior and Lord? Every one of us have been called to salvation, and every one of us have been called to serve or to serve us. God has gifted us to serve. He has entrusted his Holy Spirit into your life to be able to gift you with things that you could not do in and of yourselves. And he's also given us the privilege and the opportunity to to lead while we are yet alive. And yet what we do know, those of us who do lead, has a greater sense of judgment. James, is that not what James says in James 3.1? Be thou not many preachers because you will receive the stricter or greater judgment. We've been called to lead called to salvation, gifted to serve, and lead while we're alive. The question is, as you lead, are you leading people to Jesus and his church or leading them away? I've often said to us, and sort of a pet peeve of mine, I guess, uh, but my wife was a waitress for many years, and I've got this sort of appreciation for the ladies and guys both who does the serving in restaurants. I've had some folks that did not do a very good job in restaurants. I I have. I I do. I have. But I try to find always some way to say thank you to the people who serve me, even if they didn't serve me very well. But I've heard too many waitresses say they dread the Sunday morning crowd. Because the Christian people that come from church, you know they come from church because they're dressed up like they did, are the meanest people they've ever met. You know, we, we will lead people. Our waitresses will notice us. But the question is, will they notice us for the Christ-like character or will they notice us for something different? We'll always lead, but how will we lead them? Second point. His word, his word is the only stable and unchanging truth in our culture. Have any of you all figured out this new math? It used to be that one plus one just equaled two. It worked out every time. But now you've got to go through, I don't know, there's all kinds of steps you've got to go through. They didn't teach us in school back in the day. I don't know how we ever figured things out. Because in our culture, things always change. Except for his word that never changes. And it must be our standard for life and godliness, yet even his word can be misused from its intended purposes. And we have to be careful of that as well. Lastly, Let me just say it this way. Christ is coming back one day. Can anybody say amen? Amen. He is. And the thing that we may not be so excited about is we're going to have to give an account when he comes back. And that's a hard pill for some of us to swallow because some of us have lived so much for ourselves. And we've not given our life wholly to Christ that we're fearful of standing before him and seeing what the end result would be. But I want to encourage you today to know that when you invest your life in Christ, 
You have an opportunity to stand before him. And one of these days, I realize that as even as a pastor of the church, and I understand that, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, I will be judged for how I led this congregation. That's what Scripture says. I'll give an account for you all. That's what Scripture says. The reality is one of these days I have the privilege to stand before a, Jesus, for a Savior who died for me. And while my life is going to be consumed to some level, all that stuff, wood, hay, and stubble, gold, silver, precious stone, and maybe through the midst of it all, there might be a chunk or two of something that comes through that fire that will be turned back to me as a reward for a life that's been lived faithfully. But do you know what I do with that? Scripture says, I get the privilege to kneel before my Savior and give that back to him because were it not for his saving grace there would be no reward would you pray with me please father we bless you today and we say thank you so much for the privilege that we have as your children to be able to call you father to know that you love us that you've invited us invited us into a relationship with yourself and given us the privilege that we might be able to know you as, as Savior, as Lord, as friend, as a counselor who comes alongside us. And Lord, the, the, the list goes on and on and on of the investments that you've made in our life. And you've invited us in this journey of life to remain steadfast, to stay the course. Blessed or happy is the man or woman who remains steadfast. Lord, I must confess today that none of us today, especially me, none of us are looking for a Job kind of life. But I pray that while we all will probably never face the trials that Job faced, I pray that in our trials that probably pale way in comparison to his, that we would find a way through that to be demonstrating to the world around us that we have remained steadfast. That our faith did not crumble, that we've been able to remain underneath the load without crumbling, without crumbling to it. We didn't flee, we didn't run, we stayed. Because you have something for us. If we can just get through verses 1 through 5, there's the promise of verses 6, 7, and 8. For when we remain steadfast, there is a reward at the end. Help us, Father, to remain faithful and lead well until we meet you one day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.